Okay, this is chapter one from your textbook. Um, it's entitled Introductions to Computers and Programming. For the most part, almost all this chapter is review of CIT 111 and maybe a little bit of CIT 120. So the topics we're going to talk about is an introduction um, to computing and programming. We'll then talk about hardware and software, like I said, which should be a review of 111. We'll talk about how computers store data. You probably talked about that in 111 and 120. We'll talk about how a program works. Um, that's mainly a 120 topic. And then the last thing is um, using Python, so how to um, run um, Python programs basically at the end of this chapter. So you should know that computers can be programmed. You can write a program which is a set of instructions that the computer is going to follow to accomplish some task and typically programs are referred to as software. A programmer is the person who writes, tests, modifies computer programs. Uh, sometimes they're known as a software developer. Um, hardware are the physical things that make up a computer. Uh, the major components of a computer are the CPU, which is the central processing unit. You have main memory, which is RAM. You have secondary storage devices, which are going to be things like hard drives and flash drives, that type of thing. And then you have input and output devices, sometimes called I.O. devices, to get data into the computer and out of the computer. Um, input devices would be things like mouse, keyboard. Uh, output devices would be like your monitor or writing data to a hard drive or a flash drive. So the CPU is kind of the, the heart of the computer. Uh, it says here that it's most important computer or component. So it's going to be what processes instructions, performs tasks, performs input and output for you. Uh, and it cannot run without software. That would be possibly system software that you talked about in 111 or software which are programs that you or someone else um, have written. Um, they have kind of random fact here that they used to be huge devices. They used to take up rooms. Uh, I think one of the first computers weighed like nine tons. Um, so they were physically large and, and heavy. Um, you may have central, or I'm sorry, microprocessors, which are basically CPUs that are put on a, a single chip. These days, um, chips have multiple microprocessors and GPUs, which are graphical processors and that type of thing. Uh, main memory um, to access data or to access instructions and run programs. Those pieces of the program or those pieces of data need to be in main memory, uh, which I mentioned earlier is RAM, which stands for random access memory. You can read and write any location you want to in the RAM chips. Uh, memory is usually um, through a high-speed interconnect with the CPU because data and instructions are constantly moving back and forth between the CPU and RAM. Uh, RAM is referred to as volatile uh, memory. So you have volatile memory, volatile storage, or um, non-volatile memory. So what volatile memory is, or what that means, is if you remove power and reapply power, everything is gone. It's, it does not save anything. Uh, Non-volatile is the opposite of that. You can turn the power off, 
turn the power back on, and the data is still there. So I usually in my 111 class ask students, you know, what's the best example you can think of of non-volatile memory? And sometimes they'll kind of throw out some ideas and I'll say, you know, back at that point in time, you probably have one in your pocket and they'll be like, oh, a flash drive. So you plug a flash drive in, which applies power to it. You can write data to it. You can unplug the flash drive, which removes power from it. And as you know, you can go back to the same computer or a different computer and plug it in and all the contents are still there. Um, secondary storage are things that are intended to store things for a long period of time. Um, these would be like electromechanical hard drives, which, um, you know, are older things. Uh, we have SSD, which is solid state drives. So these are basically hard drives that instead of having sp spinning platters and moving arms, moving parts, uh, they just store it in uh, flash memory, typically. Um, as I said before, input is the way we get data into the computer. I said keyboard, mouse, uh, but they've listed touchscreen, scanner, cameras. Um, input um, devices, um, a disk drive can be considered an input device because it moves things from the device itself into the CPU or into memory of the computer. As far as the output, um, I usually think of this more like with the list they have here. It's like your monitor, your printer, a hard drive, a flash drive. And the top comment is you can be storing lots of different things. It may be text, it may be an image, it may be audio like music, it might be what's referred to as a blob which stands for binary large object which might be a bit stream or a collection of bits some type of data um, you're trying to store um, it could be word documents excel spreadsheets etc um, i kind of alluded to this before as far as software um, the computer itself is controlled by software that would be referred to as system software sometimes the operating system and then on that computer on that operating system you would run application software like Python Word Excel Teams etc um, application software are things they define it here is that you might use for everyday task uh, which Word obviously is word processing, but it could be your email client, your web browsers, games that you're playing, almost anything that an end user uh, would use that is not system software would fall in the category of application software. Um, this is a little further breakdown. Operating system controls the hardware components or the computer. Um, a utility program is something that performs a very specialized task. Um, and then you might have software development tools if you're a programmer that are used to create, modify, and test uh, programs. At the very end of this chapter, we'll be talking about a program called IDLE, uh, which is an integrated software development um, tool or program for Python. You should know this from 111 and probably from 120 as well is all data in a computer is in binary that is base 2 ones and zeros. Uh, we will be doing some number systems stuff. If you've had it with me before you probably know how to do this very well but I think number systems are a very important part of networking, programming, and um, CS in general. So I teach number systems and give homework on number systems for every class I teach with the possible exception of on the rare occasion when I teach uh, CIT 105. I would not do 
full-blown number systems in that class. Um, so the smallest unit of memory in a computer is typically referred to as a byte. Um, these days a byte is considered 8 bits. When I was going through school and was in computer design, uh, the first thing you had to know is how big a byte was on the computer. So I've worked on computers that had 4-bit bytes, 8-bit bytes, 16-bit bytes. Uh, it used to be variable, but for decades now, if you say byte, it is considered to be 8 bits. And basically those bits are set to either 1 or 0. And like it says here, here's how uh, computers store uh, or represent um, data inside the computer. Um, this is basically talking about binary number systems. I have lectures on number systems where we talk about binary, base 6, I'm just sorry, base 16, base 8. Uh, but basically the digits have weights and whatever position it is is um, 2 to that power. So if you start to the right of a, a byte, the first bit would be 2 to the 0, the next would be 2 to the 1. Um, so you've probably experienced that before and like I said I will have several lectures on number systems that will probably give you more insight to this if you need a refresher or if you haven't done it before. Um, in a byte, 8 bits, it's only possible to represent from all zeros, which would be a zero value, to all ones, which would be 255. Uh, so there are 256 possible values a byte can represent, and those are zero to 255, like it says here. If you need to store larger numbers, you then have to um, stick it in consecutive bytes and have more bits to represent uh, values uh, greater than 255. Uh, the computer only understands the ones and zeros. Uh, what is represented by those ones and zeros are something that we force on it. On the previous screen we talked about storing uh, decimal numbers. Uh, if you're going to store character data, then most computers that are not IBM computers use something called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And when you have something in ASCII, uh, the numeric value like 65, if you have a 65 stored in a byte, that would, and if you're reading it as a character, that would be an A. Um, to handle character sets from other countries and expanded character sets, they had to do something. Um, they came out with something called Unicode. All the ASCII characters are the same, uh, but you can represent characters from other languages as well. So Unicode's been around uh, for a long time. Uh, to store floating point numbers, negative numbers, um, the, each computer has its own encoding scheme. Um, you might do something like say I'm going to take um, six bytes. That'll be a numeric value. The decimal point will be assumed to be in the middle of that. And then I'll have another byte that is a 10 raised to a particular power so that I can represent really large numbers. Um, I don't know that we will deal with anything like that in this class. Um, we may, but we probably will not. So you have something called uh, floating point representation or notation uh, to represent uh, floating point numbers and bigger numbers. Uh, as, when we talk about data, things on a computer, we typically refer to them as being digital. This means they're stored as ones and zeros. Uh, if you have a picture, uh, 
each pixel uh, will have a representation, a numeric value that represents the color of that dot. And when you put all those dots together, really close together, they make a, an image, whether it be a still image or possibly a moving uh, video. Uh, as far as music, we do something called sampling, which is to take the sine wave or, or the analog wave that represents the song and then we look at the amplitude and convert that to a numeric number and then when you reverse the process take that numeric number convert it into a sound and play it through a speaker then we hear whatever sound uh, was recorded um, the cpu has something called microcode which are very small operations like move something from memory to register A, move something else to register B, multiply A and B together, put the answer to A, store A off um, to some location in memory. Um, each brand of CPU has its own instruction set. Um, so if you're, you're doing Intel, if you're doing Motorola, if you're doing IBM, uh, the instruction set is going to vary in size. And then the op codes, which are the operation codes that tell what you're doing, are you moving, are you adding, are you shifting. Uh, the set of instructions, the ones and zeros that tell the CPU to do that function may be different among the, the different brands. Um, again, a uh, program must be copied uh, from your hard drive or whatever secondary storage you're using into RAM and execute it. And this is a cycle that the CPU really goes through. It fetches, which means it's going to read an instruction and it's going to decode that instruction which determines what operation or operations the CPU is going to perform and then the execution step is to actually perform the the operation so here they're showing you some instruction 10100001 coming into the CPU that's the fetch um, two is the decode that will happen um, on the CPU. The CPU will then execute the instruction and um, it just continues doing that over and over and over billions of times a second uh, to perform whatever task it is being asked to complete. Uh, so those ones and zeros, those opcodes I was talking about, is referred to as machine language. Um, if you move up one step, instead of having to code in ones and zeros, which I've actually had to do before, is, is write a whole program in ones and zeros and enter those ones and zeros when I was in school a long time ago. Um, the step up from that is assembly language and you have mnemonics, uh, which are easier to understand, easier to read, uh, easier to write, easier to input into the computer, but not as good as what we have now. Not a high level language, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, an assembler is a program that takes assembly language that I was just talking about and converts it into machine language so that the CPU can actually execute your program. Uh, a low-level language is what assembly language is considered. A higher-level language um, is something that's going to be more like English, something like C or Java or, or Python. It's a little more intuitive, a little easier to understand. Um, within programs, here's some key terms that, that you need to refresh yourself on. Keywords are predefined words that we use in a language. These would be things in, in Python like print, input, int, float, you know, just thousands of, of um, words that you 
we'll find out that you can't use as variables because they mean something special to the interpreter or compiler. Um, operators perform actions on data. So these are going to be things like addition, subtraction, logical and, logical or, uh, maybe bitwise shift, that type of thing. Syntax is a set of rules that you have to follow. If your program is not syntactically correct, you will get an error. You'll have to figure out what you did wrong and then go back and fix it. And a statement is basically a line of code, something like x equals y plus 1. So it's telling the computer, take y, get it from memory, add 1 to it, and stick the result in x, for example. Um, now, if you write in a high-level language, that has to be, um, if, if you're using a language that's not interpreted, which uh, if you've already watched the video, you hopefully know Python is, but if you're doing something like writing a C++ program, it takes that high-level language and you have a compiler that converts it possibly into assembler and then ultimately into machine code so that you have an executable, which is a file of binary instructions to the computer telling it how to perform some operation. Um, an interpreter, which Python uses, interprets the code typically as it goes. Uh, a true interpreter does it line by line, but uh, Perl will compile it into a internal format. Python will encode it into bytecode. Java will, will convert it to bytecode for Java Virtual Machine things that I've already talked about in a separate presentation that, that you uh, should have already hopefully listened to. Uh, source code are th the steps, the complete program that you've written to accomplish a task. As I said, as it's going through and in interpreting or compiling a program, if it finds a problem because you didn't write the statement correctly, you didn't follow the rules of the language, you're going to get a syntax error. Um, I'm not sure if they'll talk about it here in a moment, but the other type of error you can have is a logical error. That is, your program will run and there are no syntax errors, just the steps you program to accomplish a task are not correct. So here it's showing you that we have a print hello earthling high-level program code. It's run through an interpreter. The interpreter will convert that print statement into many instructions, not one. Many instructions feed those instructions to the CPU. CPU will execute those instructions and then it goes back and uh, would read the next line of the program and repeat that process over and over again until the program finished executing. Um, this is starting a little bit into uh, Python just to let you know uh, what's coming if you haven't used Python before. There will be separate lectures on the different ways we might use Python in this class. Uh, but for this to run, Python has to be installed on your computer. So that's going to be one of your early on homework assignments is to make sure you know how to run this on a Unix server that we have at, at Bluegrass and that you have idle installed on your computer to run it. Uh, we'll probably install command line versions of Python. If you have a Mac, which is a Unix machine, it'll already be installed. If you have a Windows machine, you can download it and install it on your Windows machine. Now, uh, Python can kind of be used in two ways. Um, interactive mode, which means you type a statement, it executes it. You type another statement, it executes it, etc. So you're interactive in something like idle. 
Uh, in script mode, this is what I would consider the more traditional way to write programs. You open up a file in a text editor and you write your program, type your program into that text file, and then you say, you tell Python to execute that script. And it will go through and read lines from that and execute it. Don't know for sure, but I kind of have a feeling that's going to be kind of the preferred method of doing things in, in this class. But I'll, I will teach you all the possible methods just so you are familiar with them. When you're in interactive mode, you're going to start Python up. You're going to see three greater than signs, which is the prompt. That's Python basically saying, I've loaded up and I'm ready to do something. Uh, you type in statements, hit return, and it goes on and uh, executes or interprets and executes the commands or statements as you enter them. Now down here at the bottom it says this is a good way to learn new parts of Perl. So basically if you're playing around you can go in there, you can assign variables, you can print this, oh change the value of this variable so that you can see how something works. Um, kind of focus in on that as opposed to writing a, a full-blown program. Um, in script mode, like I said, um, you put them in a file and then you say Python file name or possibly Python 3 uh, file name at the command prompt. Um, the extension doesn't have to be .py but that's kind of a de facto standard. You put .py on there so somebody looks at it, uh, sees that file in a directory, or you email it to them, they're going to say, hey, that's probably a Python script. Uh, the interactive environment that I talked about is IDLE. IDLE stands for Integrated Development uh, Learning Environment. Um, it is an IDE, an integrated development environment. That means you can edit, you can compile, uh, you can check syntax, um, that type of thing. If you have Python on a machine, it should have IDLE installed. Um, and like I said, it is interactive um, or a way to interactively uh, run and play around with um, Python. So, um, you can read this summary here. It's just a list of things we talked about. Uh, there will be some accompanying videos and assignments to go along with this to make sure you understand this material again. Hopefully a lot of this was reviewed for you. And to also run some simple Python programs so that you start feeling comfortable with how to create and execute a Python program.